welcome to our session on in multimodal interactions. So I would like to start introducing my colleague Jared Strodeman. He's part of the conversational design team, and he's also a lead product designer for the Google Assistant. And this is my esteemed colleague, Adriana Olmos. She is also a product designer on Google Assistant's user experience team, where she is in charge of the design effort for third-party multimodal experiences. Before we dive right in, I wanted to share a personal a story, a story that I feel really captures a perfect real-world example of a multimodal experience. I was traveling to Asheville, North Carolina in October to attend uh, a wedding for two of my friends. And I'm originally from West Virginia, so North Carolina is not that far away. And I had been to Asheville one or two times, but didn't know the town very well and didn't have a good idea where to get dinner. Luckily, my hotel had a concierge desk, and so I talked to the concierge about um, what I liked, what I didn't like. We went back and forth. He was asking me questions about how far I was willing to go, whether I had a car. Um, and after he talked to me for a while, he did something very interesting. He narrowed it down to a few restaurants, and then he handed me over the menus to those restaurants. I took a moment to peruse those menus, looked at the things that we were looking to, uh, to kind of eat, uh, and I made a decision. And I told the, uh, the concierge that we had decided to go to this southern restaurant. Um, at which time, he actually resumed the dialogue with, between me and him. And he said, well, when you want to go, how many people are going? And he made the reservation for me. So in this multimodal interaction, the voice part is represented by the dialogue between me and the concierge. And the visual part is represented by the menus. And to me, this kind of ep epitomizes what a multimodal experience looks like in the wild. Designing multimodal experiences is an interdisciplinary effort. My background is in voice design. So, uh, so I've been designing conversational interfaces for several years now. So anything that involves spoken input and the things that you hear, that's my area of expertise. Adriana comes from a more traditional visual interaction design background, websites, mobile ac applications, and so forth. But it takes uh, combining these, these two efforts, along with things like motion design, UX writing, user research, visual design, to create a really cohes cohesive monolithic user experience for multimodality. But before we go any further, let's take a quick step back and talk about how we as human beings experience things in the real world. So imagine the last time you were walking down the beach. You could literally hear the ocean, smell the salinity of the water, and touch it. And it's all these senses triggered at you simultaneously that makes a compelling experience. By contrast, today our technology is mapped into mostly three main uh, senses, sight, hearing, and touch. And actively, the way that we consume content is basically based on sight and hearing. So for the sake of this talk, we're going to be focusing in these two. So in order to have any chance at all of designing a compelling multimodal experience, it's an absolute prerequisite for you to know what each modality does well and what it does poorly. So for example, voice does some things really, really extremely well, and other things it's just abjectly terrible at. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. And it's really important for you to recognize what those are so you can leverage those liabilities and avoid, uh, leverage the strengths, rather, and avoid the liabilities. Um, so let's start with voice. So voice is very, very good at flattening a menu structure and providing direct access to what you need. Before I started using Google Home, I used to think that the mobile, my mobile device was the epitome of convenience. It's always right here in my pocket, and I have really quick access to information, and every facet of my life is on this beautiful device. But then, when I started interacting with Google Home across the room in kind of a far-field way, I was able to ask it across the room, what's the score of the West Virginia Gonzaga basketball game? And it would give me that score immediately. Compare that to pulling the phone out of my pocket, unlocking it, going to the sports app, going to the college basketball section, looking up the score, and there's the score. 
when you, when you do that with a far field interaction, it makes pulling the phone out of your pocket seem too inconvenient. And in many ways, that's changed the game. So as compelling and exciting as the benefits of voice are, and there are many, there, it doesn't come without its drawbacks. And one of the biggest drawbacks of using voice as an interface is its ephemeral nature. So users can only retain a certain amount of content, a finite amount of content in their short-term memories. And so as designers, you have to manage that if they have any hope at getting through the interaction at all. So for those of you who may have a visual design background, or for those of you who have developed websites and mobile applications, imagine if the only visual affordance that you had to present content to your users was a scrolling ticker that goes across the screen. And the user can only look, remember that text that just evaporated on the edge of the screen to help them get through the interaction. This is what voice designers grapple with every day. And this is what we as designers have to manage. And I'm not even sure if it had a chance to cycle all the way through, but that's what the ticker said. So obviously, content, big chunks of content are better presented, and it's a lot easier for users to absorb on a static screen like this. Let me give a really quick example. Let's say I want to ask for the hours for a restaurant in San Jose. I would just ask Google Assistant, when is Black Sheep Brasserie open? Here's one approach to answering that question. Black Sheep Brasserie is open today from 5 o'clock to 9.30 p.m. and tomorrow from 5 o'clock to 10 p.m. on Saturday from 5 o'clock to 10 p.m. on Sunday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and again from 5 o'clock to 9 p.m. and they're closed on Monday. All right, so while it's usually a good idea to anticipate users' needs and over-deliver, when you present so much content that the user can't grok any of it, it becomes meaningless. Here's another approach to that. Black Sheep Brasserie is open today from 5 o'clock to 9.30 p.m. Here are the hours for the rest of the week. So you give the, salient, the most salient pieces of information up front, i.e. the hours for today, and then you defer to the screen for more dense content that the user can peruse at their leisure. And then finally, one of the drawbacks of using voice as an interface is when I talk to Google Assistant, people can hear me. That's kind of how talking works, right? So imagine if the, next, the person next to you right here uh, in the middle of Adriana about to say something really profound and amazing, decides to pull out their Pixel phone and ask Google Assistant what the score of the Warriors game was on Tuesday. That would be really obnoxious, right? And of course it is. Um, but there are some t social taboos associated with using voice interactions in a public setting like this. And even though the device is capable of it, it really limits the range and access of voice interactions in public settings like this. By the way, if you're really interested in this topic, there's an incredible session happening at 3.30 today on stage five given by Daniel Padgett. He's gonna be talking about the right uh, use cases, the right voice interactions for your application. I highly recommend it. By contrast, visual interfaces can be as permanent or complex and dynamic as we want it to be. And in fact, it's just a matter of milliseconds. There's a lot of information that can be delivered. Take, for instance, just as simple as a traffic light, and we can uh, control the timing of the red to green in order to convey some meaning. Or it can be as sophisticated as the YouTube app, where you can consume content, also follow up what is happening, what is trending, and tell Silver whether you like it or not that video. So there's a lot of things that you can do just in one screen. Now, the question is how we're going to be combining voice and visual information in a way that is beyond passive consumption, that is actually for building inter interactive experiences. And one approach is through conversation. In a natural conversation that we have with people, we point at things, we describe things, and there's this nice back and forth among human beings. It just happened natural. And uh, the thing is, like, when we start thinking about applications that are happening on mobile, uh, they, they, there's a lot of information that we convey right away, but we have to be careful. For instance, let's think of this uh, mobile app for ordering food. From here, there's a lot of things that I can quickly do. But if you remember the last time you called or you walk into the store, you're actually having a conversation with the person, and there's 
information or chunks of information that deliver back and forth. So if you put these two together, they look really different. And in fact, probably it's more closer where we're seeing today, today with chatbots and where we're starting to experience with the assistant. So one important piece of information to take into account is that not because you have an app on your phone, that should be your starting point. It should be more a conversation with a human where you should be inspired in order to start building your applications uh, that is going to live in the Google Assistant. So multimodal interactions is not something new at all. And in fact, you have experienced this in the past. Uh, you probably tried a karaoke machine. There's sound in the background. And then you have the, mu the, the visuals. And then you are singing along. So there's a lot of things happening. And that's a multimodal experience as well. Uh, we also experience asking Google for uh, questions. And then Google will present the search results in a list. But what we have to think is like how we're going to be combining these two modalities in a way that is not overwhelming to the user. So Jared and I are very familiar with the strengths and weaknesses of uh, these modalities, voice and, uh, voice and visual. But the problem is, is that it's easy to fall into the trap that because we design for one of surface, we know how to design it for all. And in fact, that was the inspiration of this talk. It's not that simple. And there's a lot of factors that we need to take into consideration. So we're going to be talking about these factors that we wanted to take uh, into cohesion when we think of all these platforms that we're going to be designing for. So we wanted to talk a little bit about these factors that we've identified to help you think about how your experiences will manifest as Google Assistant comes up, uh, to more surfaces. And these factors are, is your user in motion? Uh, is the device designed to be used if the user is walking, running, driving, or some other situation makes the, that makes the screen otherwise inaccessible? Think of your phone as opposed to your TV. The next is the environment. Is the device designed to be used in private or anywhere? And is there a one-to-one -one relationship between the user and the device, like your phone? Or is it uh, designed to be shared among a group of users, like a Google Home? The next is proximity. So are you close enough to tap, to quickly tap on the uh, device to interact with it? Think of a wearable as opposed to something like um, Google Home or your TV that's optimized for far field interactions. The next is audio capability. Um, does your device just have a very small mic that can capture speech from a, a, a few feet away? Or how, uh, does it have an entire array of mics that is designed to capture speech from across the room? And of course, visual capability. Do you have a full ergonomically compatible QWERTY keyboard, like a, a laptop? Or is it a smaller one, like on your phone? Or are you dealing with something, e something even more primitive, like a D-pad on a TV remote? And then finally, visual output. Um, and that basically just really boils down to uh, screen size. So, these are the factors that we want you to consider um, and keep in mind. And we're going to kind of go through a few of these on some surfaces where Google Assistant has already been deployed and where we anticipate that it may show up. So keep in mind that this is kind of a future-looking, uh, a forward-looking uh, presentation uh, to give you some guidelines by which to anticipate how to deploy your actions on other surfaces. So let's talk about Google Home first, but since it was such prominently presented in yesterday's keynote. And it's um, getting a lot of traction in the marketplace. So I mentioned before about how voice is really incredible at flattening the menu structure, and it's really, really convenient. But there's another bit of upside of speech that I think is really important to present in the context of Google Home. And it's that speech, what I'm doing right now, that is the interface. You're able to interact with Google Home in a way that you've been doing since you were two years old by just speaking to it. So there aren't any manuals. There's no tutorials. There's no learning curve. All you have to do is know what kinds of features Google Assistant generally supports, like weather and, uh, and sports. And you just ask for those things the way you would ask another person. 
So if we look at some of the factors that I outlined earlier, um, if we look about whether the user's in motion, they're not, right? You put your Google Home on a kitchen counter or your nightstand, and it's usually planted there for, for quite a while. Um, Google Home is deployed in a private setting, your, your home, um, but it's shared among a group of users, so it's, it's, it's somewhat private. And you don't have to be close enough to interact with it. It's optimized for far field interactions. And if we look at input output capabilities, it's got really, really strong capabilities for audio, both input and output, but very little on the visual side. So we've distilled three really kind of overarching guidelines for how to design for assistant in, um, actions on Google Home. Um, and the first one is don't read, listen. And what I mean by that is as you build actions and as you develop experiences on Google Home, you may be pulling content from some online source or something. And a lot of these sources are optimized for written content, right? They're, they're designed to be read with the eye, not the ear. So you may think, it may be tempting to think that you can just take these sources, run them through a text-to-speech engine, and voila, you have your voice interface. It's not that simple. Let's take an example. So in the context of a weather forecast, for example, this string of text makes perfect sense to you, right? If I were to translate this string of text into something that's appropriate for spoken language, I would say, in Mountain View, it's sunny with a high of 77 degrees with winds out of the north to northwest at 10 to 15 miles an hour. But listen to how this, listen, listen to how ridiculous this is when you run it through a text-to-speech engine. Sunny, high 77 F, winds in NW at 10 to 15 MPH. Like totally incomprehensible, right? So just when, when you uh, get your data source and you run it through, just make sure that it's appropriate for spoken content. Don't read, just take a few samples, run them through your text-to-speech engine, and don't look at the text. Listen to it to see if you can understand it. The next one is avoid information overload. I've already kind of lamented about the ephemeral nature of speech, but I think it bears repeating. Just be careful how much content you present to the user. So if I ask um, Google Assistant on home what movies are out right now, or you want to develop an experience like this, this is one approach. Here's what's playing at your favorite theater. Alien Covenant, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Commune, Champion, Wakefield, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Snatched, The Fate of the Furious, The Boss Baby, Smurfs The Lost Village, Gifted, and The Circle. Do any of these sound good? So not only does it, over, does it bombard you with 12 movies, it forces you to make a decision afterwards. So it's, it's kind of a stressful experience. Compare that to this. There are 12 movies playing at your favorite theater. Here's what's new this week. Alien Covenant, Diary of the Wimpy Kid, and The Commune. Should I tell you about any of them or keep going? So that presents it in much more manageable chunks that's easier for the user to kind of manage. And then finally, answer the question. That sounds like a pretty vague statement, so here's what I mean. If you have something like a map, or the user's asking for directions or navigation, a map um, really is efficient at communicating information in this really nice, compact, rectangular shape. Right? It conveys how far you are from your destination, what the preferred, the preferred route is, uh, what some alternate routes are, how, what traffic looks like, all that kind of stuff. So it may be tempting to just punt to the screen on interactions like this. Um, so when uh, Google Home was first deployed and people were asking for questions about directions and navigation, this is how we handled it. Sorry, I don't have a screen, so I can't do that for you. So pretty disappointing and unhelpful, right? So we learned our lesson. We thought about why people are asking Google Home these questions. And we kind of distilled a few salient points about what people are asking for, right? In the Bay Area, the quintessential question is uh, 280 or 101. What's traffic look like? How long is it going to take me to get there? So we took this pro approach instead. The best way to get to work by car is through 87 and 101 North and will take about 19 minutes in light traffic. So even though an image of a map is much more efficient and can convey a lot more information to the user, there's no reason why you can't distill the most salient pieces of information into a neat little verbal summary. Now, let's talk about smartphones. 
So mobile phone has this wonderful machine that we, we bring everywhere in our lives. And uh, the thing is like there's no one way in which we use our phones. The volume would be up one minute and next time it's going to be down. Probably you will be running to a session or then you will be pairing with a headphones. Take for this is, for instance, this example. Uh, I used to live in Canada and I was up there at the ski slopes and uh, we knew that that day was going to be a snowstorm. And we needed to know what time we needed to get that or the hills because otherwise we were going to get caught. And it was at the time where we wished we could just ask the phone and say like, hey, when is the snowstorm going to start? And because uh, the last thing we wanted to do is take out our mittens when we were up there and then our phone flying down. So it's a time where we wanted to, we, we could wish that we could use our phone as a little home that we were carrying in our pocket. There were other times where we're running and navigating pedestrian traffic and you wish you could speak to your phone and quickly get an answer to your question. But in that example, the last thing you want to do is have all this information be blurred as you and just want to glance at the screen. So the needs and the capacities of these devices are really vast and very broad. Uh, we can be static in one position and in other times we are running to places. Uh, we use them in a very private or public context. And what is wonderful about them is that we can have like rich interactions to them. What is even more compelling as well is that there's a lot of output and beeper capabilities. At the keynote, we saw this exciting demo where we can even use uh, the cameras a, for on a form of input. So based on this, we came up with three guidelines that we have been observing while we're crafting our experiences at Google. If one mode goes away, the other one should take over. Let's see another example. Let's say I'm designing a third-party application called Geeknome. And what Geeknome does is tells me facts about numbers. It's very simple. I pull out the phone, and then Gigmon greets me. And there's a lot of cues that it tells me that Gigmon is there in person, and he enter the conversation. And also, it gives me suggestions of what I could say, or I can say my, my own number. But here's how it looks like if I was not really paying attention uh, to the screen. Howdy. This is Gigmon. I can tell you facts and trivia about almost any number. Like 42, what number would you like to know about? So this is what you heard in their response. But in fact, if you pay attention, it's a little bit different than, the, than what you see in the chat bubble. We introduce little things like, this is Gignome, as a way to introduce himself when he entered the conversation, because we didn't have enough visual cues in order to prompt that. And we also add little uh, suggestions as part of the dialogue to prompt the user of what is what they could say and give them ideas. But we didn't put that in the chat bubble in order to not to make it super commercial and, and visually complex, because you already have the suggestion chips there below the chat bubble. So it's very interesting that we optimize for the strongest mode, but allow for both. So let's see another example. It's basketball time. Let's think that Samuel wanted to go at the beginning of this month to see the Warriors. And uh, he can ask Ticketmaster uh, through the Google Assistant for, for the next um, place that he could go and buy tickets for. And it's very simple and normal to see a list. You see that in every website. And that's the way in which we can consume this type of content quickly, because in a list, we can quickly scan things. Then the question is like, how are we going to be presenting this uh, through auditory content? OK, the Golden State Warriors have a few games coming up. The next one is against the Jazz on May 2nd. Which one do you want tickets for? So if you look, if you look at their response, uh, we say small things like, OK, so in order to acknowledge that we are having this conversation and making it sound more conversational. Also, we included uh, the, the first um, play that is the, the next one with the jazz team that is happening on May 2nd. And this is in order to give a bit of information to the user also through auditory content. Notice as well, we didn't list it every single case because it would be overwhelming. And we didn't include that in the chat bubble. And what is very interesting is that this, this type of approach 
lets you to consume the content when you have the two type of modalities, or also it's, it's a graceful fallback when, you, when the one is the absent of the other. So it's very important that we leverage the strength of each mode and avoid redundancy across all these modalities. So we've talked about the surfaces that Google Assistant already is deployed on, right? Google Home and Android phones. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit about where it's going to show up in just a little bit. And I want to start by a surface that was prominently mentioned in yesterday's keynote, the TV. So if we quickly look at some of the conditions around uh, how the DV TV is deployed, it is a static device. It's like literally anchored to your wall. It's, n it's not moving. And, and even though the user may move, it, it's not going to move with it. Um, it is designed to be used in kind of a private setting uh, among a group of users, much like Google Home. And it's too far away to touch to interact with it. Now, this is the interesting thing about TVs. Look at where this is on the output scale compared to the input scale. Very, very rich audio and visual output capabilities, but quite moderate or limited input capabilities. What does that tell us? That tells us that the TV is mainly a consumption device and not really an intense interaction device. And I think that the, uh, the reason that we're kind of bringing this up is as you anticipate your actions coming to life, through Google Assistant on TV, just know that we have to kind of minimize it onto a, ba a banner on, on about the bottom third of the screen to, to not disrupt after active programming going on while the TV is um, being played, right? So we don't, because it's primarily a consumption device, people are watching programs, we want to kind of leverage just that um, bottom third real estate for that. So know that when your experiences come to life on TV, that's how they will manifest. And because we have a few car people in the audience today, we wanted to touch a little bit on uh, cars and Google Assistant on cars. Android Auto is an existing solution which does a beautiful job of uh, moving audio-rich audio content by way of projection from your phone onto your car's interface. But let's talk a little bit about where the car shows up in our multimodal matrix. So, um, it is not static, right? It, it is moving around. It's carrying you around at 80 miles an hour. So drivers really shouldn't be looking at the screen a lot. Um, and even though cars are out and about in a public setting, the cabin, uh, the interior of the car is ostensibly a kind of a private setting. Um, and users generally have access to quick uh, touch interactions on their car to uh, adjust their temperature or change a station or something like that. But you don't want car, um, the driver interacting with things a lot. They should be driving. Um, in terms of input-output capability, cars have these really robust stereo systems. So there's nothing wrong with just presenting a lot of spoken output. Um, and they have pretty decent mics, although sometimes recognition is a challenge with all that ambient noise. Um, but here's what's interesting. If we overlay Google Home on top of the car, they, they're strikingly similar in terms of where they fall on this matrix. So what does that tell us? That tells us that Google Home is a very voice-forward, almost voice-only device. And that tells us that the car probably should be somewhere in that range as well. So a few takeaways as we kind of summarize here. If you don't take anything away from today's talk, please take this away. Know the strengths and weaknesses of voice as opposed to visuals. Leverage what speech does well, leverage what the screen does really well, and avoid the liabilities that we've talked about. Optimize for the strongest mode, but allow both. If the screen does something better, point the user to the screen, but still let them do it in voice. And even though these interactions involve both visual and auditory modes, they're usually invoked by a spoken input. So make sure that the, that the first bit of content that you're hearing is appropriate for spoken language. And one of the overarching principles of using Google Assistant, the thing that we strive for at Google when it comes to bringing these solutions to life for you, is we want them to be efficient. 
Um, and each turn in a conversational dialogue should be really short and sweet and easy for the user to absorb and consume and help them get through their interaction. So we talked a lot today about how to package our response and making sure that all these two modalities uh, cohesively convey a compelling response and also that they're there to serve in case one is absent. And we also talk about conversational design and how important it is to get inspired from having a conversation with a human before we jump into diving into design and the application. But the work is not over. There's a lot at Google we need to get moving. And one of them is like once we have um, agnostic response, how is that we are going to be presenting this response automatically that is taking into account the context in which the user is at? Uh, whether if they're running, how we were to present that information, or if they're just passive sitting in a couch. Also, how say we more and more can do this crossing between one type of surface into another in a matter that is almost magical and the user doesn't have to ask for it. And even more further, like now they're launching our multimodal interactions on the phone, how we can make these uh, interactions like list and cars and all these things that the people can interact with more uh, dynamic to allow for more complex interactions and uh, in a way that is more rich and easy to use. So we're very excited that you guys are joining, joining the journey and start building your applications with us. Uh, there's uh, going to be a lot of other talks happening today and tomorrow. You're most welcome to join in case you're interested in uh, the related talk for the Google Assistant. And probably you have heard as well that uh, there's a challenge, and we can't wait to see all the things that you will be submitting to it. Thank you very much.